Well, thank you for coming on. Moms don't have time to read books. And as <laughs> as is evidenced, you really don't have time to read or to write. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I feel like well, I need I to have whisper. To make the time. You have to make no, the no, time. No, no, it's okay. You're in my AirPods, so it's oh, yes. okay. I can okay. hear you up close. Yeah. Oh, very smart. <laughs> do I sound do I sound okay? I have my mic and stuff connected. You sound perfect actually. I should I was actually awesome. thinking I should do the same thing. I should get little I should, anyway. <laughs> um, well, thank you. So the 12-year-old you mentioned who's upstairs, is that the one from the book who was the ba- is that the one who was in kindergarten when you decided to there was something you decided when you were in when she was in kindergarten to change yeah, your to job, quit my job to quit your job and all that. Mm-hmm. Okay, so now she's 12. Yep. Okay. She's 12 now. Yes. And wow. our 2-year-old is Isla who is the I talk about our TTC journey with her and then uh, Maximus is our third daughter who was our surprise at the end of dedication. So Aww. yes. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Um, so can you please tell listeners what After the Rain is about? Oh my goodness. Okay. So yeah, After the Rain is my fourth uh, collection of work. And I've been joking and saying it's like my big girl book because um, while the other books are very near and dear to my heart after the rain really kind of gives this memoiric experience of like the different lessons that I've learned throughout um, motherhood throughout my life so far and um, I don't know it's I wanted like I've been thinking about the words to put with like what is after the rain and for me it feels like a collection of of hope and a collection of um camaraderie because I want people to be able to see themselves in the pages um, no matter how different their experience is from mine but just knowing that there's this collective um, healing that's possible throughout the book. It's amazing and you talk um, a lot in the book about how you yourself have overcome trauma and that's in part how you found all the tools that you needed to sort of get you through life and that you're now so generously sharing with the rest of us. Um, and you, you touch briefly on some of the ways in which you felt like you were not loved as much as a child, which kind of broke my heart when I was reading, sitting on the steps and the gold flap of the mailbox while you waited for your dad. And then he never showed up and how that broke your heart and made you feel like you were unlovable. Take me back, if you don't mind, to some of the experiences that you felt were sort of really difficult for you as, as a child and made you not feel like you could love yourself? Mm. Um, so I've, I always had kind of this on again, off again relationship with my biological father. Um, and I have not had a relationship with him for the past, I would say like 17 years. So it's been a very long time. Um, so in that regard, you know, that's kind of just been the norm, but I think mostly what I talk about in After the Rain is my relationship with my um, since she was my primary caregiver. Um, and she did the best she could with what she knew. And our relationship has come a long way. She's an amazing grandmother to my girls, um, an awesome mother-in-law to my husband. And we are now um, at this stage in our in our mother daughter relationship that we can really lean into our relationship from two women's perspective versus this mother daughter dynamic, which feels, um, it feels really supportive and also um, good boundaries are in place for the growth of um, a healthy relationship now as a 31 year old woman. But growing up, she didn't really have, have the tools to, to love me, I would say. Um, and I'm able to see that clearly now as an adult, instead of penalizing her or judging her um, for what she didn't do, I'm able to see that she had her own experiences, her own traumas, her own um, stuff that she was going through. And But when we don't tackle those things, it's hard for us to love our children um, in the ways in which that we should. So becoming a mother, I knew that I wanted to, I needed to love myself in order to give my 
then one daughter and now my three daughters, the best of me. Um, and self-love was definitely a, a bloom in, in, pr in process, I like to say, but also like my greatest teacher in a way, because now I'm able to not only mother um, my children from this place of love and understanding and attention and presence, but from like a self-mothering standpoint, which I find is really important. Um, we don't often talk about how motherhood um, also like gives birth to us <laughs> in a sense. And um, being able to do that three times over now and really learning the different um, methods of like care for self, I'm able to, sh to show up and care for my kids. Um, in a very different way and love my children in a very different way from how I was raised. And that is really like the greatest lesson in all of it, no matter the trauma I went through and the triggers and um, the hardship, but it's like, okay, what can, what did I do with those lessons? And it has spilled over into how I show up in my motherhood um, today. That's beautiful. Um, and I was going to get to your mom. I wasn't only going to talk about your dad, I promise. <laughs> I just don't have a relationship with no, him. So I I'd rather not. Like, no, you I know. get it. I, I just, it was just the disappointment. It was just that feeling of, of disappointment and sitting there and, you know, just like, you know, your parents disappointing. Parents always end up disappointing in some ways or another, right? But that was such right. a moment. And then like your mom screaming at you in the car when you were trying to scooch away the day that she was in a bad mood. And no, I get it. And, yeah. uh, um, you know, it takes a really, and you're only 31. Oh my gosh. Like I'm 44 and I'm finally getting to a place where I'm like, okay, <laughs> maybe it's their issue and it's not directed at me. Not like my, maybe. right. <laughs> So I feel like you have a full on leg up on like the world from like a maturity standpoint, which is great. <laughs> um, it's been a long time coming. That's absolutely for sure. Yeah. Well, I don't know. You, uh, you still are ahead of most, the, most of the world in terms of, you know, that sort of self-acceptance and all that. Um, what makes you want to share this? Like you've learned so much. You've mm. sort of reparented yourself as like a therapist would say. Why, yes. why, why share it? Why give it to everybody else? Why not just, you know, go about your, your life? I know you love to write and you've been writing ever, you know, for your whole life and all the rest of it. But what is it about this message that you think that you really want to just get out there? And why? Community and letting folks know that they are not alone in their struggles and what they go through. And I think it's really important um, to share stories that folks can see themselves in or um, that they can feel like, man, I'm not the only one who went through that. Or man, I'm not the only one who went through something and now I can be on the other side of that. I mean, that's the big messaging in After the Rain. It's like, what comes after the rain? The light comes, the rainbows come, the clouds part and we can see um, hope and resilience and triumph and also knowing that like we're gonna have stormy seasons in life like it's not just gonna be after the rain and then boom like we're just gonna have these sunny days it's like no we are gonna as human beings we move through things and our storms are the are what teach us something and um while you know a lot of what i share in this book is absolutely personal to me it's also really pivotal to my growth and the type of woman I am, the type of person I am, um, the type of woman I continue to strive to be, which is one who is able to greet not only self with compassion, but others with compassion. And um, to know that like, you don't have to pretend to be perfect. You don't have to pretend to have it all together, that you can show up flawed on the page. You can show up flawed in life and still be worthy of moving through whatever it is you're going through. And I think that that's really special and important. I find that a lot of times we are chunked in this circle as women that we have to like be strong and not have any traumas and not have any triggers. Or if we do, hush, don't say anything about it, right? And it's like, that is not supportive to the collective to hoard these stories that have shaped us and maybe that have hurt us, but also that have shown us uh, the benefits of healing and facing things head on. 
totally agree. I do feel like, and I don't know about you, at least on social media, there's been a little, sh- I feel like there's been a shift to people sharing a lot. Do you know what I mean? Like some people are still caught up with the perfection, like here I am on the beach and look at my, like, I'm so amazing. And, you know, mm-hmm. I just want to, you know, I'm like, I can't even look at this bikini right now. But other people I feel like are really <laughs> like, you know, I, you know, my husband just told me he's gay and now I have to live with that. And here's how I'm crying mm-hmm. on my pillow. Like, I feel like there's been a, a, a sort of shift to sharing the most intimate. Um, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Do you feel like that? And I, I mean, I feel not that your book is like exploitatively sharing. It's per, it's It's a perfect, you know, balance. But I don't know if you've mm-hmm. noticed that too, or just anecdotally. I mean, I think I've noticed people's vulnerability um, being more accepted. And I, I think that that's special. Um, I do think there is a line in, in which we have to be mindful of the stories that we're sharing because yes, there are stories, but there are other, there are, they are also other people's stories, right? So it's like before I, um, I, I let my mom she read the first copy. I bookmark every chapter about our story. I wrote her a beautiful letter and we had a really healing moment before anyone else got the book. I got my husband's blessing to share about our hardships from the fertility to the infidelity that we faced uh, prior to getting married. And like, we have to be very mindful of the stories that we hold in our bodies, but also other people's stories that we decide to walk into and tell. And that is something that I find um, extremely delicate. It's not something I take for granted at all, especially as a writer, knowing that I have multiple stories um, that don't just include me. It's not just about me. So that goes back to my work as um, being really centered around community and how it's so important that we are mindful of um, what we say, how we say it, and what we share. Very true. So how do you stay so mindful? How do you keep all of these principles that you espouse in the book that are so awesome, but then there you are like trying to get your kids down for a nap and life sort of keeps coming up, right? How do you keep Life will continue to come up. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Just how do you keep it top of mind? How do you make sure that in the moment you're remembering all the things that you know deep down and, uh, and you don't let it you know, I know there was a scene at the beginning of your book where, you know, somebody at your office said something super rude to you that I honestly couldn't even believe. And you were on the street just, and you were trying not to scream back at him and you managed to pull it off in like a very clever, awesome way, but you just wanted to scream and rage on the sidewalk. And how do you pull it back? Like, how do you pull, how do you pull it back? I guess. How do I pull it back? Um, I used to be really bad at pulling it back (laughs) and, um, it's interesting because I, um, I think it's important how we leave people, you know, and how we engage with people. Um, Maya Angelou has a quote that's along the lines of like, people will remember how you treat them, right? They will remember how you left them feeling, um, And even when someone is like that boss in that chapter change that you're referring to, um, I could have easily been just as awful back, but what would that have done? Nothing, right? It would have made me look like a jerk, just like it made him look like a jerk, you know? And it's just like, it's not worth the energy. And linking this to holding it together while in quarantine, while mothering three, while also being a wife, while also working from (laughs) home, it takes a lot of um, practice and self-awareness. So I know when I'm on edge and everyone in house knows when mom's on edge, my husband knows he's home full time with me. Um, So that's, you know, I understand the privilege there, but I'm able to literally step away and say, Hey, I need a moment. Um, So all of this really requires being self-aware enough to name what we need and like putting some of our baggage down and letting other people help us. Um, And I think in motherhood, that can really get challenging because I kind of feel like sometimes like we just get it done. Like that's what we do. We get it done. And it's like, but also our partners, if we are in partnerships um, in my position, my husband, like he can also get it done. 
and I have to be able to name what I need. And um, I think that that's really special. And that's how it really, I'm able to like keep myself together because I can be like, hey, I need five minutes. Hey, I need 10 minutes. Hey, I'm going to go take a drive. I need to go run these errands. And then also recognizing that in my husband too, when he, when I'm working all day and he's hands on with the kids all day, like making sure he's getting his time. And it's just a community effort, right? Um, So holding it together requires me to take care of myself so I can take care of others. And I often say this in my work, self-care as community care. If we look at taking care of ourselves as an extension of showing up in our relationships and our work, et cetera, then we're really kind of able to find that balance. It's not always perfect. It's not always pretty, but it's definitely a practice that's worth, you know, leaning into. You know, I hear about self-care all the time and I feel like, we might need, like, I feel like we need a new name for it because self-care sounds indulgent. Do you know what I mean? Like self-care sounds like I'm like kicking it and like, you know, being selfish almost. Right. But I, Mm. but it's not like that. It's essential, right? It's, you have to do it. It's, it's, it's like, I don't know. I feel like if there was a different name, maybe I wouldn't feel guilty doing it. Do you know know what I mean? Like, um, I've just been shifting to like taking care and then also self-care as community care is how I teach it when I'm teaching workshops and when I'm on my podcast and when I'm like showing up in these community spaces where it does feel like, you know, self-care is the selfish thing. But Audre Lorde says it best. It's not, it's not self-indulgent. It's a radical act of, uh, it's a political statement at that, especially for women, right? To be able to even take five minutes to go pee in peace, (laughs) to go wash your face, to like take a second to get back into your body. It doesn't have to be a latte or a manicure or a face mask or a massage, right? There's this, there, there are these other means of refueling and re-nourishing that are also extremely important. It's more like baseline em- emotional regulation, right? It's more like- Exactly. <laughs> it's like you have, it's like getting back to basics. Like this is not an option. Like if you can't- No if you can't pull your emotions together enough to like finish bath time, then you need to do something. You need to do something versus like screaming at the kids. You know, I mean, I feel like so often those like, you know, sort of intense feelings, you know, snapping, even just like, you know, loading the car up yesterday or whatever with all the kids and the dog and the bags and the this, and I could feel myself like snapping at everybody. And I'm like, I'm losing my patience. And like, why, why, why where do we have to go so badly? We're just going home. You know, I don't know. It, um, yeah. But it's, it's like, a balancing act. It's, it's hard. It's not easy. It's yeah. not pretty. I don't know. I know Instagram makes self-care looks, look so beautiful, but it's really the nitty gritty is when it's like, you're deep in it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so tell me a little more about writing this book. Tell me about like how long it took and where you wrote and your process and all of that. Yeah. So I, um, oh my gosh, it took me like a year and a half, two years to write this book. And I was eight months pregnant with our youngest when I turned in my manuscript. And I remember my editor saying, we will prom- we will try to give you like some time so you can be in postpartum. I was like, I'm putting a boundary. Okay. Like after I have this baby, y'all are cannot email me for like a month. And it's just funny. We (laughs) laughed about it. Um, So not only was I writing this book, I was growing a baby and it, so I was like giving birth to two things (laughs) simultaneously. And um, I did a lot of writing here at home. And I also uh, had to, I had to get through, I kind of got stuck in the middle and it was really hard. So my husband was home with our uh, two and I went to a hotel back when, you know, you could do those things, not in COVID. Right. Um, And I went for a weekend and I just knocked it out. And I remember feeling really, really accomplished that I was able to do that in a quiet place in an unrushed place. Cause you know, writing a book from home is like, really hard when you have kids and you know we are our little one our our middle child she was still very little my two youngest are 20 months apart so it was like very intense and I needed that time so to be able to go and finish in peace and um in quiet was really amazing it took a while um but then once I was in flow it was just like boom here it is and then by eight months 
I was by, by eight months pregnant, I was ready to turn in the manuscript. And it was it was great after that. Wow. I love how you yeah. sprinkled in quotes and it's like it's such a great book, like inspirational. Like even if you don't have time to sit and read every single word, your quotes, even just like getting a quick dose every time you open it, open it is is just fabulous. Yeah. And a great cover, which always yeah. helps. Thank you everything. for that. <laughs> yeah, the co- isn't it beautiful? It's I beautiful. love it. They did so good. It's so beautiful. And, it really is. Um, funny story about the cover. Like we went back and forth on the cover. Oh my gosh. And we finally got it to where everyone was like, you know, I think the first one that we looked at was the one. And <laughs> it was just, it's just hilarious. Like the things you have to go through, like when the book is when the manuscript is done, but you still have to get like the little things together, like the cover and like, where is the gold foiling going to go? And how is it going to be debossed or embossed and all those things. And then you get it and it's like, oh, it was worth it. So the one we first started with was the one that we ended up going with after like 20 other mock-ups later. (laughs) And your first, your first books you self-published and now you're in the regular, not regular, what's traditional publishing world. Traditional publishing. So the first, yeah, my first two books I self-published and then I was with a different smaller publishing house um, for Neon Soul and Today I Affirm, um, which Neon Soul is a collection of poetry. Today I Affirm is a journal. And then um, I got picked up by Chronicle for this, for After the Rain, and then a partner journal that's coming out called Encourage. Um, So it's going to be, it's really amazing. And um, being self-published at first was definitely like wonderful. Um, I learned so much. I was able to build my audience and build my readership in a really authentic way. Um, so now to be, I'm four years into the traditional publishing world and I, I really love who I landed with for After the Rain Chronicle is just, they're wonderful. Oh, that's great. Um, do you have yeah. any advice for aspiring authors? Oh my gosh, write the story, just write. I tell this all the time um, to the folks who in my journaling courses and who come to my workshops just write the story, just put it on the page and everything else will fall into place. Um, Something that really supported me when I first got into publishing my work eight years ago was a friend told me, stop hoarding your story. You never know who's going to need your story. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, no way, you know, that, and she was like, no, yes way. Just put it on the page. And since then I have been, keep I keep that at the forefront of my mind especially when I'm sharing things that um, are intertwined with like adversity and um, uncertainty because we never know who needs our story and who will benefit from it and we're never alone in our struggles and I think that that's really important to um, to center in our work I'm literally writing it on a sticky to put on my computer. On, on my computer right now. <laughs> you never know who needs their story. I love that. Yeah, I'm putting it right here next to you. <laughs> um, that's great. Um, well, Beautiful. Alex, thank you. Thank you for um, using your precious nap time moments to chat with me today. And um, thank you for your lovely, soulful book um, that I'm sure will help countless people out there. So, um, So thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.